when you look at all the old masters, they all cross trained. They all borrowed from this person and they all borrowed from that person. Hello and how's it going everybody? Welcome. You're listening to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio episode 610 with my guest today, Master Instructor Michael Salona. I am Jeremy Lesniak. I am your host on the show. I'm the founder of Whistlekick and I love traditional martial arts of all sorts. And if you want to see everything that we do to support the traditional martial arts community, go to whistlekick.com. That's where you're going to find all kinds of stuff, including our store. And that's one of the ways that we help pay the bills at this show is with the store at whistlekick.com. We've got a bunch of good stuff over there, shirts and uniforms, and there's still some sparring gear and a bunch of other things you can check out. And if you use the code podcast15, it saves you 15% on anything that you buy there. The show, Martial Arts Radio, gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, because no one's ever accused me of creatively titling things. We bring you two episodes each and every week with the goal of connecting, educating, and entertaining you, the traditional martial artist of the world. And if you want to help the show, if you want to help our big old scary mission, well, you can do quite a few things. You could make a purchase. Like I said, you could share an episode, tell people about what we're doing, help us grow, leave reviews, pick up a book at Amazon, grab a program at whistlekickprograms.com or support the Patreon. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash whistlekick. If you contribute as little as a couple bucks, we're going to give you back original content you will not find now or ever anywhere else. If you give us a little bit more, we're going to give you more. In fact, the more you're willing to contribute, the more you get back. So go check that out at patreon.com slash whistlekick. Later today, I will be recording the exclusive video episode that we do. And if you're in the appropriate tier, you'll get access to that. What is it? Well, you have to go find out because I haven't decided yet, but they're fun. They're good. People like them. People don't stop contributing very often. So we're doing something right. Today's episode is with another passionate martial artist, someone that I found a lot of synergy with, with somebody that I think, you know, our, our stories are so similar in so many ways. And when I get to have conversations with people like that, that I can relate to, that I can see myself in as we're talking, it's just, it's, it's engaging, but it's also inspiring to see how other people took their martial arts journey, how they're doing some things that are similar, but other things that are really different. And that just continually keeps me pumped up on martial arts because there are so many directions that we can take what we learn. So instead of going any deeper, I'm getting out of the way. Let's do it. Michael, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, Jeremy, how's it going? It's going great. I appreciate you being here. How's it going for you? Going well. Sun is shining, feeling pretty good, feeling loose and ready to dive in. Nice. Nice. You know, it, it's funny that even when we're inside, we really react to the weather. You know, oh, I it's agree. a beautiful day out, but I'm inside. <laughs> and that might create some some frustration or some tension. Or, oh, the weather's terrible outside. And I'm mad about that, too. Yes. When we're inside, I don't think we're ever happy about the weather. Right. <laughs> Right. We're, when we're, we're outside, very, we're happy about it when it's good weather. We're very much connected to it. Very yeah, much. We are. Both, I think. I think more than we realize. Yes, both in a positive and in a negative way. Mm. You ever train outside? Of course. I love training outside. I do too. Except when it's cold and rainy. Cold, I can do because you can put on clothes, right? But right, you know, when when that ghee, that dobok, whatever gets gets wet, mm -hmm. it's kind of. I don't. I don't I don't mind it quite so much when it's wet. It's cold and wet yeah. that I that I can't deal with. Like, you know, in the summertime when it's hot, sometimes, oh, sure. sometimes we'll go out for a few minutes and when it's raining, you know, with my advanced class and we'll do a couple things outside just to say, hey, look at us. You know, we're uh, we're doing we're doing cool stuff in the rain, <laughs> you know, and uh, everybody gets a kick out of that. But uh, cold and wet. I uh, I'm, yeah. I'm too much of a baby. Not a fan. Not a fan. Whether it's martial arts context or hiking or I got to work around the house or whatever. It is. But if it's cold and wet, I'm probably unhappy. Yep. Yep. It's funny. Um, you know, this this past winter, we had uh, a, a number of storms here in uh, the Philadelphia area. And 
we had to cancel classes uh, one of the days. So it was, uh, I believe it was a Monday. And Monday's like the day of the week that it's like my day that I bust out all of my, my forms. So I know how I feel. Like that's like my tradition. Like that's like my time to practice my forms. And if I don't get to that for whatever reason, I hate myself. So I thought it'd be kind of cool because, you know, we, we were doing the classes and then we have, you know, the online element because of the people that are still uncomfortable training in the studio. So I thought it'd be kind of cool to go out in the snow and do all of my forms. So speaking of, you know, being cold and wet, you know, I was bundled up pretty good and I, uh, you know, filmed with my phone myself doing the, the various forms in our system in different settings and stuff like that so that when the students watch it, they can follow along. And just for fun, I decided to do one in my dobok, no shoes, you know, no hat, no gloves, just mm. old school. Hardcore. Dobak. And I did uh, my Hanchi Chodon. And I think about, <laughs> it's about 10, 15 seconds in, I was like, what am I doing? Like, it was so cold that my feet were causing the snow to instantly turn to ice under my feet. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't want to fall down on the camera. And then I'll, you know, I'll never, uh, I'll, I'll never hear the end of it. You never know? live that down. Yeah, yeah exactly. It, but it was, uh, it was fun. But at the same time, it was, uh, it was miserable, but in a good way. <laughs> I think there's something to be said for, that kind of uncomfortable training because yes. real life, I mean, if we, not everybody cares about the real world application of martial arts and that's okay. But if you do, and the only time you train is in the school, mm-hmm. in your uniform, comfortable, then, you know, what about that application? And it's something that I, that I think about. And so when you, you talk about being in the snow, being uncomfortable, being cold, you know, how often are we, you know, hurrying in the winter? from point A to B, not really paying attention because, you know, we didn't, we didn't bring a hat or we didn't wear a warm enough jacket. And, you know, that's a great opportunity for someone to take advantage. Yes. And I, and I think that there's something to be said with, you know, getting to your, your previous point, you, you need to have at least, at least a little bit, some point of, of being uncomfortable or mm. learning to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, almost like you're embracing it a little bit. And I think that you people that are, you know, like, I don't want to say, you know, old school or new school, but like somebody who's serious about their martial arts training, you know, you need to be comfortable with that at some point, you know, at least in my opinion. I agree. The idea of getting comfortable with being uncomfortable, I, I think there's a strong thread of that that weaves through martial arts Mm -hmm. you know if you are comfortable i think by definition you're doing things that you've always done in the way that you've done them you know comfort when we think about comfort what's comfort it's sitting on my couch uh in climate control and maybe having you know some manner of beverage that i enjoy and there's no you know the 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 house isn't on fire and (laughs) people aren't driving me crazy and Mm -hmm. you know whatever it is but in order to progress, we've got to stretch those boundaries and stretching boundaries by definition is uncomfortable. Yes. Yes. There, there, there needs to be, you know, not, not to the point where it's, you know, overwhelming or, or counterproductive, but, but, you know, like if I got frostbite on my feet, then, you know, then I might not be able to train. Like I want to train for a while, you know, <laughs> get my toes amputated or something right. like that. Like, like that, that's not smart, but, um, you know, I agree. I agree. There needs to be some kind of pushing the limit or some kind of pushing the boundaries and, and, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the idea of being uncomfortable is kind of like it comes with the territory. One of the things that I like to think about when when we talk about martial arts, I, I I often bring things back to weightlifting and, and other, let's say, quote unquote, more traditional fitness disciplines, because there's some objectivity in there. You know, when you talk about running, you can run for time and you can, you can score it in a way that we really can't score 
martial arts. I mean, I'm not talking about competition, but scoring progress. It's, an, mm-hmm. it's almost entirely subjective. And when I think about weightlifting, the ability to move a certain amount of weight, if I can pick up 100 pounds, I don't get better picking up 10 pounds or 20 pounds, which is really comfortable. It's easy. Mm-hmm. I've got to pick up 60, 70 pounds out of that 100 that I can move for my body to progress. And yes. one of the, the things that studies have shown us in that realm, and I think you could make the same claim about martial arts, that the more time you put in, the closer and closer to that boundary you have to get in order to inspire the body to change. Yes. Yes. Not only that, but you know, you need to, every once in a while, you need to, to see that type of progress so that you feel motivated to do it again. Mm. You know, and I, and I think, you know, if you're doing the same thing, getting into your, your, your uh, weightlifting analogy, you know, if you're lifting only half of what you normally can lift because it's comfortable, you know, over an extended period of time and like, Hey, you know, I haven't really seen any growth or any progress. It's like, maybe I'm not pushing myself close to my boundary often enough right. to see progress. Yeah. How, how do you get faster at throwing kicks? You got to throw them really fast. Mm-hmm. You don't get faster by doing a bunch of slow kicks. <laughs> Your forms don't get better by doing them, walking through them, you know, half i guess i'll say it half-assed right <laughs> right you know yeah. just like uh you know i'm putting in 50 percent. you know you don't get better that way in fact you probably get well depending on how old school the place you're training is uh almost everywhere i've trained training that way you know you get a, a hand upside the back of the head yeah, yeah. <laughs> so h- how about you you mentioned old school new school would you know where did where'd you start along that continuum what was what was early training like for you so i started in the early 90s uh, i started in uh, 1990 at a school in philadelphia under under lewis marvel and from what i remember since it was since it was so long ago i feel like training was 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 tough in the beginning i mean i was you know i was 10 years old when i first started so i wasn't in the you know the hardcore type of class in in the very beginning because I was mostly with children beginners but I'd say maybe a year year and a half into it um when I was able to jump into like the teen adult classes as a uh, brown belt or red belt I noticed a shift in how the uh in how the the classes were done you know I was training more with the head instructor and I, I, I'll never forget the first time I experienced continuous contact, like Dojang type sparring, where you're, you're not stopping and starting after every point. So previously, you know, everything we did sparring wise in class was, you know, you know, three, three points and you're done time for a new match kind of thing. And I did okay at that. You know, I was always very, uh, like I, I had good flexibility, but I was, you know, a little bit on the weaker side and, and um, you know, kind of small, um, you know, so I tried to be quick and everything. So I was okay at doing point fighting, but I was afraid of contact. And that was one of my, that was one of my big hangups. So point fighting was, was okay for me. So then when I uh, jumped into this, you know, the older and more, you know, uh, I guess you can call it an old school type of training. Um, I remember I got tagged really good in the head with a roundhouse kick by, by an older boy. And I looked at my instructor, like, are you going to call stop? And this other kid just kept coming at me and I didn't know. And it was like, no, you, you keep fighting. And that was really eye opening. And that was like my Mm. first dose of like, you know, this is, this is a little more, a little more intense, a little more old school. Um, I remember we did a lot of uh, a lot of physical conditioning, a lot of body conditioning, doing drills where we're, you know, smacking arms together and and stuff like that. And in the beginning, I was I was resistant to it because I wasn't, you know, it wasn't what I was used to, and it was a little bit tough and there, I'm sure there was some, it was nights, uncomfortable. It was, yeah, it was very, yeah, exactly. It was uncomfortable. And, uh, 
you know, thankfully my, um, at the time my father was training along alongside and, uh, he was able to relate like, Hey, this is, this is like your next step is being ready for this type of stuff. Cause you're, you're going to get better. And, uh, you know, he, uh, he always had a, 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 um, not so gentle way of putting it, you know, you know, and I don't know if you'll have to edit this out, but he would be like, Oh, you got your ass kicked again today. It's like, thanks dad. You know, or, uh, <laughs> stop locking with your face. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you know, that kind of, that kind of stuff. And in the beginning, like it was, uh, it was really tough, but I started to become more receptive to it and a little more resilient uh, to it. And then I think the big turnaround for me for when I, 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 I kind of changed my mindset was, I want to say I was maybe 13 or 14. I bought a copy of a book of five rings mm. by Miyamoto Musashi. And, uh, you know, I was at the time I was going through a phase where I liked anything samurai and i thought that that was that was cool and i liked the artwork on the front of the book and uh i picked up a copy on a school field trip to uh philadelphia believe it or not and uh, i sat on the school bus on the uh, on the way home or the way back to school reading a book of five rings and it kind of changed my mentality towards training and how i viewed that you know that 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 hardcore type of training that, you know, that I, I felt was, was improving my, my martial arts. I was a little less resistant to it. Nice. Now you mentioned your father, was he at all part of the reason you got into it? Actually, no, I started training first. Um, and then maybe about a month or two into training, uh, my father joined, but my father had experience, you know, he, kind of grew up in a, in a rough area. My grandfather passed away when my dad was really young. And, you know, my dad being the youngest of, uh, what, four brothers, um, you know, he kind of had to fend for himself a little bit. And, uh, you know, he played ice hockey. So that was kind of like a rough and tumble kind of, kind of sport, you know, in Philadelphia in the 1970s, where everything was uh, Broad Street bullies and Rock'em Sock'em hockey. So my dad had that kind of that kind of mentality. So when he started training, it was something, it was something that we did together. You know, I didn't play, I didn't play hockey in school until much later. So martial arts was always my, my first love. And that was something that he and I had, had, had done. So he was coming from like that, that tough upbringing kind of, uh, kind of mentality to kind of push and guide me in the, in the, you know, in the direction that I ended up today. Mm -hmm. So I, I look back on that time period as, you know, one of my favorite times training, you know, even though it was very, uh, uncomfortable at times. And, you know, my, 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 uh, everybody hated sparring my dad because he had those big concrete, you know, <laughs> forearms and stuff like that. He was very, very strong, but, you know, uh, it, it was always a learning experience and it was always, you know, if I survived without getting too banged up, then I felt accomplished. You know, I mm. felt like I had a good, a good class, you know, like, like I got somewhere. So yeah, I, we trained together for about eight years. Uh, he stopped after he got his first on. Um, but I, I, I look back on that fondly, that time period. Nice. Yeah. Sounds like a lot of good memories and, and probably some interesting conversation on the drive home. Oh times. yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was usually, it was usually like uh, uh, how I messed up or how I did wrong. Mm. I was, it, it, when I was younger, I was always a, a forms and weapons kid. Yeah. That was yep. what that was. I can what relate. I, yeah. That was what I leaned to at first. That was what I got, you know, decent at first was, was forms and weapons you know, I, I didn't improve my sparring and, and things like that until until later on as I got a little bit older, which I guess is kind of like most most kids when they start off in, in, in martial arts, they tend to gravitate towards the, the stuff they view as as cool, like, you know, doing doing some kind of fantastic form or some kind of cool weapon or something like that. So, 
You know, I think I was very typical in that sense. Now you started at kind of a a an interesting time, right? Because mm-hmm. you're you're right there, kind of. If I'm if I've got my math right, you're just before Ninja Turtles movies come out. Yes, but age wise, I think you said you were ten. Yes, when you started. So you're you're kind of headed into that adolescent phase, which you have a school, you know, it's a time where a lot of kids start to fade away that 10, 11, 12, especially 13, 14, you know, Mm -hmm. if you keep a kid through that time, it is, it's, it's a victory. Yes. But it, I'm I'm not hearing that you stepped away just in the, in the language that you've used. Am am I correct? Um, When I was a, I want to say a junior and senior in high school, I didn't train as much as I as much as I would have liked to, you know, I was playing, I was playing hockey for, for school or whatever. So I was kind of sporadic in my training, but I did train a bit on my own when I couldn't get to the, get to the studio. Um, so all the way up through, I guess, um, I guess my sophomore year in high school, I was training, you know, maybe four nights a week. So I was a lot for a kid. Yeah, I was there all the time. So when, you know, shortly after I got my black belt, I kind of slowed down a little bit. I played a little bit of sports in school, but I never lost my uh, I never lost my love for it. And I always maintained I always maintained my practice and my skills and I could get to the studio, you know, like I said, not as often as I would have liked. Um, But I always knew that, you know, when my schedule kind of freed up a little bit that I would go back and right after I graduated high school, um, I jumped back in with both feet, you know, three, four, five days a week, you know, whenever I could get in, I, I was fortunate to, um, when, when I started going to college, I went locally, I went to the art Institute of Philadelphia and, um, it was just a short bus ride over to the, uh, over to the Dojang. And I was able to, uh, I was able to get there, you know, after classes, I was, I was done my, my schedule, my first couple of years in college was, was great in the sense that I was done most days by five o'clock and I had Fridays off, which was awesome. So I was literally getting done classes at school and hopped on the bus or walked if it was nice and, uh, went to the studio and was there until you know, nine, nine 30 at night training, you know, for, mm. you know, four or five nights a week. So, you know, so I, you know, I always felt like I needed to make up for some of the lost time when, when I wasn't training as much as I would have liked, you know, my, my, my junior and senior year in high school. As we already said and acknowledged a lot of adolescents, you know, fade away during that time. And you're, you're a teacher now. Mm-hmm. Is there anything from your time at that age that you stayed engaged? Anything you learned that you incorporate now to keep younger students involved that listeners might be able to learn from? Um, I I think one thing that I try to do is I try not to fall into the trap because you figure if I've had a student for a number of years, like if they started when they were eight you know, seven, eight, nine years old, by the time they hit 13, 14, they might be around first degree black belt or close to it, you know, if they're, if they're training hard and they're committed, you know, at that age group, if I'm going to keep them around, it needs to be fresh. It can't just be, you know, you're going to learn your next form or you're going to learn your next weapon. I, I, I think, you know, at least some of the schools that i seen and have been a part of in the past um that's really all it was after after black belt it was a lot of here's your new form here's your new your new weapon and i think after a while people especially if they've been training four or five years you know when they hit that high school stage they might they might look at that as either boring or it's not cool or whatever so um, the one thing that I've been trying to do has been trying to add new and different and exciting things, whether it be Bunkai type stuff or, 
you know, or, um, you know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which I've been uh, studying for the past five years. So it's, it's something new and it's something different and it's, you know, it, it doesn't feel so repetitive. I, I think that's the thing that, that I try to do. And I, at least for the most part, I feel like we're successful with, I mean, we keep a fairly decent amount of our, of our teenagers. So, I mean, not <laughs> COVID aside, you know, right. it's kind of, it's kind of hard <laughs> yeah. to judge right now because, you know, because of everything going on, but, at least that's what I try to do. I mean, the um, the general rule at my studio is that members have their required material that they have to learn and develop to a uh, a certain standard, a certain level. Um, but I make no secret that there are so many other things that I can teach and that they can learn if they, you know, if if it's warranted, if they you know, if they show that they have their material down to a certain point, I, I, I try to say, okay, well, here's this form that we don't practice, or here's this self-defense skill that we don't normally practice that's not required. And I, I kind of tailor it to, you know, that person. If that person is more of a forms or weapons person, then then sure, you know, I'll show them something like that. But if they're a more self-defense sparring, you know, type of person, and they like, you know, for lack of a better term, they they like a little more of the the rougher stuff or the um, you know, the practical application stuff. I kind of, you know, show them something like that, or mm. you know, at least that's that's the experiment that I'm that I'm currently <laughs> doing right now. That's the second time that you've brought up kind of recognizing the individual and helping maybe guide is too strong of a word, but at least an awareness that different people respond to different aspects of martial arts training. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this, this is such a divisive topic because some instructors will say, no, you, you've all got to learn this and this and this, and I don't care if you like this more than this, you're still going to do it. And I've even to a certain degree advocated for spending the most time training in the things that you're the least that you enjoy the least because that's probably where you suck the most yeah and that's going to lead to the most benefit overall how do you manage that because you know of course if we leave teenagers yes. especially <laughs> up to their own devices you know if if the kid likes sparring they're gonna only want to spar if the kid likes forms they're only gonna want to do forms mm -hmm. you know and and you fall out of that well-rounded martial arts curriculum Mm -hmm. How do you balance that? So um, I, I, I think in that sense, we've uh, I'm, I'm lucky with our organization. We've, um, for lack of a better term, we've uh, reduced the number of requirements that mm. that we have to teach for our association. For example, um, I came up through the uh, World Tongue Sudo Association. And currently, from white belt to black belt, there are 11 empty hand forms that you have to, you have to learn to, to achieve a first on. Um, and I believe if their curriculum is still the same, um, they have two uh, weapons forms, uh, staff forms. So the uh, the organization that I belong to, because the forms themselves are not the old traditional forms, but they're uh, modern interpretations of of the older forms. Um, we have five, so the number, you know, drastically is reduced from from eleven to five to reach first on, and then they have one staff form that they have to learn, and they have one nunchuck form that they have to learn. So it's kind of spread out a little more. So my, my belief is that, okay, the number of requirements as far as forms go, for example, is less than what it was when I came up. But at the same time, in some respects, the forms are a little bit more difficult because there's more kicking, there's, there's, less, uh, there's less repetition in the forms. So in, in a sense, they're harder to learn, but there's less of them because they're and they're and they're very dynamic. So 
I try to tell the students, okay, you have this material that you have to learn, which is not a whole lot if you practice diligently. You know, you can pick it up relatively quickly. And then you have these other kind of skill sets that you can you can pick up, you know, according to what somebody's personal preference is. Um, coming up through the belt ranks, we had to do um, a set of 30 one-step sparring uh, hand techniques, 30 one-step sparring kicking techniques, and 30 one-step sparring staff techniques. And, you know, myself and some of the other instructors that I'm affiliated with, we were like, you don't really need that many. If you're, tr- if you're trying to develop a sense of distance and timing and things, things like that, and, and teaching kids how to, how to move and how to cut angles and things like that, you don't really need 30 hands and 30 kicks and 30 staff. So we whittled the number down to like the 10 best hands, the 10 best kicks, and the 10 best staff techniques. That way somebody could theoretically learn it, you know, relatively quickly and get it to a a higher level so that that way they have the freedom to, to explore other aspects of their training. And we have the freedom to introduce other aspects of training that might not be you know, uh, um, prevalent in like a very strict, you know, kind of by the book kind of, kind of system. So I'm thankful for that. I'm right on board with you. One of the things I've seen over the last probably 10, 20 years is this tendency towards accumulating as many forms and things as possible as styles become hybridized, mm-hmm. you know, you, Oh, I, I grew up in, in Goju and Taekwondo. And I'm going to take all my Goju forms and I'm going to take all of my Taekwondo forms and I'm going to have my students learn all of them so they can get the best of both. Yeah. But that dilutes the time in on any one. Yes. And it sounds like you are, Honestly, I I feel because I've talked about this a little bit, but it sounds like you're a little bit ahead of quite a few people, which ironically is the way it used to be done, that there is something to be said for the simplification because it allows you to focus a little bit more and creates a little bit of space so you can individualize and focus on those aspects of training that interest you. Where did that, um, was that something you realized yourself, something that you took from, from another person, because again, this is not the way most schools from my vantage are operating. Mm. My, um, my instructor, uh, his name is Grandmaster Young Hyuk Kwan, and he originally came up in the uh, Mudakwan, you know, Tung Sudo, Spukdo. Um, so he, he had learned all the traditional forms, uh, such as, such as I, I did when I was part of the World Tung Sudo Association. And one of the things that he wanted to create was he wanted to create a a system of forms that kept kept the 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 traditional mindset and the traditional way of doing things but also a uh, dynamic you know uh, kind of free flowing kind of um how could i how could i explain almost a modern traditional form. So mm-hmm. over the last 30 some years, almost 40 years, he created the the system that we do today um based on the movements that are in the older forms. So for example, when you watch our first three forms, you'll see elements of you know the old Kicho Young forms or the Pyongan forms you know, or Basai, like you'll see, oh, that move is borrowed from that form and that move is borrowed from that form. So he took the things that he felt were, um, you know, um, the signature of each of those old forms and created, you know, something that was a little more modern, both from a, um, both from a a, a practical sense. So he didn't want to, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater kind of thing. He didn't want to go in that direction. And then he also didn't want to go, 
strictly to like the XMA style. Okay, we're gonna add we're gonna add flips in this, which it, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. And there's um a certain high degree of athleticism for somebody that's that's into that that kind of thing. But he wanted to create a modern version of the traditional forms that somebody could go to an open tournament and compete with and do well, but yet mm. still keep that that traditional kind of look to it, if that makes any any sense. So our system is kind of like a like a like a mix of like that traditional tongue pseudo taekwondo. So that's kind of like where the base in what we do kind of came from. The, the word coming to mind is evolution. We yes. have a, a a very difficult time as traditional martial artists here in modern times. It's 2021 when we're recording this to look at what was and find ways to allow things to modernize without becoming completely different. Yes. You know, it, it's almost like we could say, okay, we can do it like they did in 1920 or 1950 or 1960 or whatever the genesis of what you're doing is, mm -hmm. or we can throw all of that out and we can do MMA. Right. And for most people, there doesn't seem to be anything in the middle. And I see all kinds of gray area there. And it sounds like you and your organization you've found some gray area. Yes. Uh, and, and I'm very thankful for that, that, you know, that my, my master had that, that foresight to kind of, uh, to kind of go in that route. And when you think about it, um, you know, the, the pioneers of all of the traditional styles, they all did that, <laughs> you know, and it's like at yeah. some point in time in the, uh, say the, the, the early 1900s, you know, it was like, okay, now nothing's allowed to change forever until the end of time. And if you're... Yeah, they never said that. Right. And they, they never people did. came after them and said that. Yes. Said, oh, we can't change that. Yes. When, when you look at all the old masters, they all cross-trained and they all borrowed from this person and they all borrowed from that person and, you know, change this here and change that there. And when you look at, you know, and, and you know, I'm kind of jumping around a little bit, but when certain masters taught a certain form to uh, to a student, you know, 20, 30 years later, they taught the same form to a different student and they didn't look the same. It's like, well, because their their karate has has evolved. It's changed with the times. And I think Kitchen Fotokoshi said that himself. You know, the world changes and, and karate must change also. And I think so many people are, you know, they're so willing to call somebody a heretic if you, you know, if you're changing something, you know, and I, and I think that that's not, I think that's not how we grow and how we improve as a, as a martial arts community and getting back to my organization, my, um, you know, our, our master wanted to, you know, we, like I said, we have five forms up until first degree black belt. And then we have a form for first degree a form for second degree and a form for third degree. And he wanted to create for years, he wanted to create like a master level form for fourth down and higher. And he, you know, he said he couldn't decide on anything and he was working on something for, you know, years until finally, and this was a number of years ago now that he had this conversation with myself and the other masters of our organization. He says, I could never fully decide on what to do with the master level form. So all of us masters were charged with creating creating our own, he would mm. call it, you know, the, the ninth form. So the masters all have a ninth form, but he said, I'm not interested in you just showing me, you know, something that, you know, that I dictated to you, but show me what you've learned and show me what you've gained and create a form that fits your personality and the things that you like best from, from our system. And I thought that that was really special and different because, you know, to the best of my knowledge, you know, nobody does that nowadays. So I very, I, very few, I, I've bumped into some schools. I'm thinking of one in particular that they, they do that. 
and I really like it. And what I, it's a school that I'm close enough with that I've actually trained there. And I hear the way people talk about it. It's, there's something incredibly personal, not only in the practice and the application of the movements, but in the decisions that go into what movements go where, how, et cetera, in a way that if you've spent time teaching, that's exactly what you want your students to do. Mm-hmm. Yes. And it's almost like this shortcut. And I, and I love that you're doing it. How long have you guys been doing this? Uh, I want to say maybe 2000 and maybe 14, 14, 15 was when our, our master charged us with that, you know, come up, come up with your own form. And so for myself, you know, I, um, you know, I got to work on it right away. And, you know, some of the, uh, some of the other masters kind of teased me a little bit because I made my form too long. It's like, I've been working on it for so long and, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to cut anything out, but, you know, I, I, I feel like as an outsider, and I can say this as an outsider, because when I watch the other masters perform their form, you know, it's like seeing something new every time, you know, and it's not just, Mm. it's not just, you know, regurgitating the same stuff, you know, back to each other, but it's like, okay, here's what my ninth form looks like. I want to see what your ninth form looks like. And it's like, well, I really like what you did there. I might put that somewhere in mine, you know, and it becomes kind of like Mm. this, you know, this, this, this relationship where we're all feeding and learning and, and growing from one another. And I think, you know, I'm very happy that, that our uh, grandmaster had, had, uh, you know, put that task to us. So it's allowed to change too. Yes. You you know, I, I love that. I love, you know why I love that so much is it's almost like a, like a fingerprint. It's a unique representation of who you are as a martial artist at that moment in time. Yes. Because I can imagine, we, you, you've been training long enough. I have, I'm sure many of the folks listening have been training long enough that you have those epiphany moments where you go, oh, and everything changes. Most of us don't have too many of them, but you know, or maybe once a decade, yep. you'll bump into some new bit of information that just makes you go, oh. And I can imagine that that form may change dramatically or even be thrown out completely through one of those epiphanies because your approach to martial arts, who you are as a martial artist, also changes in those moments. Yes. And I, and I think being willing to change is something that, that sadly so many, maybe not so much now with how, um, how information is so readily available now, but... You know, I, I and I think some people might still be stuck in that mindset that they're afraid to tr- change or that they are uh, somehow betraying somebody or betraying the old masters if they if they change anything. And I think, you know, I think being able to change and and grow is something so very important. I mean, you look at and I and I believe it was uh, might have been Ian Abernethy who had mentioned this, he's like, if, if, um, you know, if something happens in the UFC where somebody starts employing a new technique that ends up working really well, well then all of the other MMA fighters start training that they start training. Cause it's like, if right. it works and it's good, then why not try that? Why not add that in? And I think that's something that traditional martial artists can, can learn from the MMA community. I, I agree. I think the problem with change or the the problem with remaining, not changing, comes down to the reason. Yes. Are you staying where you are, doing what you've always done because you're afraid of trying other things, progressing, possibly having an epiphany that makes you go, oh, I could have been doing this differently for the last however many years and it would have served me better for what I wanted. And so resistant to that progress, Mm -hmm. or are you changing because something about what you're doing is really hard? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, oh, this form is really hard. So we're not going to do it anymore. Or, (laughs) um, you know, I don't like 
point sparring. So we're just going to not do it anymore at our right. school. Right. And, and you see things like that. Yes. And, you know, we talked about it earlier, the stuff that you have a, a difficult time with. That's, I think that's where the progress is. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do you balance that? You know, we've talked a lot about the freedom that you and your organization have to pursue things that are of interest. Mm -hmm. How do you I think, make sure that people are, are not dodging the stuff that maybe they need a little more time on? I think personally, I think somebody needs to spend enough time, you know, in the box, so to speak, you know, doing things by the book, by the numbers, so that they can create uh, kind of like what uh, I think it was actually Mr. Miyagi who talked about, creating that strong root. You know, mm -hmm. having having that good, solid base, you know, not being somebody that's going to practice something for four months and then say, OK, I want to try this and then practice for another six months and say, OK, um, that's not working. Let me try this. I think having the knowledge and the wisdom to fully or at least mostly understand something you know, as, as much as you can so that you can make almost like an educated guess, you know, on, mm -hmm. okay, maybe we should explore this, you know, and I think that that comes down to experience. I think, um, you know, would I put a belt rank on that? Probably not, because I think, you know, we, we could probably both agree that different ranks hold different value across different arts and different associations, you know, so I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's tough to say, but I think when somebody fully grasps, you know, a certain set of concepts or a certain way of doing things, then they can kind of, then they can kind of branch out and, and, and see, you know, uh, how they might change this or how they might change mm -hmm. that so that they, they can kind of understand, you know, the value in what the old thing was so that they understand, okay, you know, let's hold on to this a little bit longer or let's hold on to this element or that element because it has served us well to a certain point and having that, that wisdom to say, okay, you know, maybe we can sprinkle this in or sprinkle, sprinkle that in and see how that, see how that serves us and be willing to, and be willing to understand or to admit that, okay, maybe that route was a mistake. You know, we tried doing this and it didn't work for us. You know, what we were doing was was the right path. And I think that that that's an experience thing, personally. I agree. And I found that quote and you were right. It's from, I don't know which karate kid, but, you know, it's attributed here. I pulled it up quickly on my phone to Mr. Miyagi. Ah, only root karate come from Miyagi. Just like bonsai, choose own way grow because root strong. You choose own way, do karate, same reason. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, yeah, much, and, and, so much knowledge oh, in those movies. Oh, so good. They're so good. They, they have no business being so good, but they're so good. <laughs> oh, oh, it's, you know, it, it's, it's amazing that the character that influenced probably, probably second only to Bruce Lee, the oh, person. Yeah. You yes. know, wasn't Pat Morita was not a, a martial artist, but yeah. had more impact on martial arts than anybody but Bruce Lee, I think. And how crazy is that? You know, you, you were able to remember a, a quote, you know, pretty close that you used as a as a reference, almost as as justification to say, because it, it's so, you know, despite being the poor grammar, it's really articulate. Right. It's a wonderful image that I think we can all understand by having a good understanding of our past, our history, our foundation, our roots, it gives us the freedom to individualize, differentiate, branch out. It's like the uh, the concept of, uh, I believe it's uh, Shuhari, the concept of- I don't um, know that one. Uh, I, it's, it's funny, like all these years, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't place, you know, like, like, how I wanted to explain, you know, this concept. And then it was either, it was either Jesse Encamp 
or it was somebody else. I, I, I want to say it was Jesse and Camp. Um, the idea of developing that strong root. Chuhari. I think in mm, yeah. Korean, it's, it's something I, else. I, I, I pulled it up. I found it. Um, I, I always record with my phone handy. Uh, <laughs> listeners, you may not know that, but a lot of times it all come up with, you know, oh, well, I think that movie was in such and such year. And, and I'm like, yeah, that was in 1974. <laughs> you may think that I'm, I'm just this complete wealth of martial arts knowledge. And I know some stuff, but quite often it's, it's Google helping me out in the middle of the show. Yeah. And so um, Shu, Ha, and Ri are our three stages of development. In Shu, we repeat the forms and discipline ourselves. This is from Wikipedia. So that our bodies absorb the forms that our forebears created. We remain faithful to these forms with no deviation. And I'm not going to keep reading because as it is, YouTube's probably already going to pull us down for, for me reading that little bit. But um, <laughs> Shu, S-H-U, Ha, H-A, Ri, R-I. Yeah. You, you can find it if you want to go deeper, but uh, please continue. Yeah, and we have the, uh, on our, our website, we have the uh, the Korean translation for it because, you know, we're Korean style. But, you know, that concept of, you know, the learning stage, and then there's the, I guess you could say, like the uh, the study stage where you're fully dissecting the things that you've learned. And then finally, uh, you know, learning to, break the rules or break the the tradition so that you can transcend it and move beyond it. You know, and I think, you know, for years before I heard of that, that phrase, I couldn't, I couldn't put it into words. And thankfully people that are more articulate than me um, kind of put that out there, but it gets back to the, the Miyagi thing. Although, he, you know, he was a fictional character it's kind of like that idea, you know, and, and his, his saying was so profound, you know, so we, we try to, we try to abide by that in the way that we do things, even, even how we practice it at my studio and, you know, on that micro kind of, kind of level, you know, we have our required material that, you know, our association has agreed to, to practice and, you know, and then we have the, the little things that we sprinkle in for our own flavor, so to mm-hmm. speak. So being that our style is called Pilsung Mudo, or the martial art way of certain victory, um, even though we all practice the same style, my flavor might be a little different than, you know, than, than one of my colleagues in my organization, you know. Somebody else in, in my organization, they might sprinkle self-defense techniques that they get out of uh, Krav Maga or, uh, you know, Filipino stick fighting or something like that, because that is their, um, that's their, their, their taste. You know, that's what they are, they're drawn to. Whereas, sure. whereas for us, you know, at my studio, we incorporate, you know, a little bit of uh, Hapkido and, um, you know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, because that's, those are some of the other things that, you know, that I've been working on. So kind of blending it in, we have our root style and our forms and our things that we do. And then, you know, adding in our own little flavor and, and being, being that I have a big interest in the study of Bunkai or Bunhei as, as we call it in Korean, you know, that's kind of like, my element that I add for my students. Like, let's explore, you know, the meaning that we can get from, from our form so that we're not just treating this as a solo exercise or, mm. or a competition type of thing where you're, you're going to go out and perform, which is great. And, you know, and, and I think there's certainly value to doing that, but I think having that deeper meaning and that deeper understanding, you know, is one of the reasons why I think we keep students longer, getting back to our original thing that we started talking about, keeping people interested, especially through the the years where they typically, you know, kind of trail off a little bit. So, so that's, that's one of the things that, that at least I hope that I can contribute, you know, to the, to the martial arts community. Nice. Nice. If people want to find you, website social media you guys got any of that stuff you've talked about some cool things and i can imagine there are people who might want to pay attention to what you're putting out yes um our uh, our schools um 
Facebook page is Revolution Martial Arts Institute. That's all, uh, you know, that's all one, all one word, uh, you know, Facebook.com, Facebook.com slash Revolution Martial Arts Institute. Um, our website is um, Revolution Martial Arts Institute.com. But uh, mostly um, the videos that I've been putting up is on uh, YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash Master M. Salona. And in addition to, um, you know, the class, the class archives that we're putting out there for our, you know, our current members to, to follow along, the ones that are training remotely, I try to put up training tips and bunkai stuff for our uh, for our members to 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 dive a little uh, dive a little deeper nice nice it it sounds like the application you know we we, we didn't get into that you know you'd sent over some notes on you know rather we had sent you questions and you'd respond and i was a little surprised that we didn't get into application bunkai bunhei uh until towards the, the end here. So I, I want to make sure we get a little bit of time talking about that because it's a subject I'm really interested in. Yes. You know, and, and again, like just about anything, you end up with these polar opposites in martial arts. And for many people, I think a refusal to acknowledge the gray, the space in between. And I, and I suspect that you and I are on the same page on a lot of things. You've got folks who say, if it is not directly applicable as it is trained, you shouldn't do it because it's a waste of time. <laughs> and then you've got folks on the other side who say, eh, just let people figure out what works for them and they'll be fine. <laughs> and then I, I think you got a lot of room in the middle and I'm I'm in the middle. And yes. I, honestly, I, I tend towards the, the let people figure it out for themselves. But I, I think there's some value in having some some application and as an instructor, some structured application training of yes. forms and everything else. So why don't you talk about what that means to you, what that looks like in, in your training and in your school? So I guess for the past, I don't know, almost 10 years now, I kind of, <laughs> I've kind of been traveling down this rabbit hole uh, for Bunkai or, or Bunhei because I felt like, you know, I, I, I was previously an avid competitor, you know, in forms and weapons and sparring. And I did the typical karate thing. And uh, I, I forget who it was, but, you know, I, when I had turned 30, I realized that, you know, there's, there's, there's going to come a time where I'm not going to be doing tournaments quite so much. And that was something that, that I really enjoyed doing, you know, and I wanted to, I wanted to explore the, the practical side, you know, or what all of these strange dance like movements, you know, what they actually mean or what they, you know, what was intended by them. So, like I said, over the past, past 10 years, I've been, I've been doing that. And I kind of looked into you know, uh, you know, Kyushu Jitsu and, and, you know, the art of attacking vital points and things like that. I kind of went down that rabbit hole, but I'd say in the last few years, I stumbled upon, um, some of the work of, uh, Sensei Ian Abernathy mm. and it kind of blew my mind as far as, you know, there's this whole other way of looking at you know, the way that the movements are done. Whereas blocks are not really blocks, you know, punches aren't necessarily punches and the stances aren't used in the way that, that people would commonly think. And it kind of opened my eyes a little bit and, you know, and I just wanted to dig deeper. So for, for me in the last few years, I've been exploring ways to bring some of this study to to my students, uh, specifically my adult students and and higher ranking, you know, teenage uh, kid students, um, you know, and finding safe ways to to practice them and 
practice them in a in a um, in a practical manner. And uh, we actually had the great opportunity to host Ian Abernethy at my studio. I want to say it was back in 2016 now. And, you know, my students are still talking about it and how much fun they had and how they really learned. So I've kind of been going down that, that rabbit hole. Um, studying Brazilian jiu-jitsu has helped as well because you know, it's, it's funny, like times where I feel like I'm not progressing in BJJ until somebody shows me a way that I need to do a certain move and I make that connection like, oh, that that's like how you hold your hands for, you know, like an aug- augmented block or, you know, a, a knife hand block or, you know, if you were to take the partner away and kind of green screen them out and just look at the position that you're in and stand it up on its side, it looks like a form. So it has helped my BJJ when I can make those kind of connections, but it has also made my karate better as well. Cause, mm. cause then I have a, a better and a deeper understanding for what this move that for the past 30 some years, I didn't understand, you know, it's just a move that we did in the form, but now it has this whole other meaning and it's really caused me to fall in love with forms practice again. You know, not that I ever really lost my love for forms practice, but, you know, it's it's really. Yeah, I, I, I get it. I completely understand what you're saying. It, it, it opens up another lens onto all this experience that you've had. And it's kind of, you know, one of those epiphanies that we were talking about. Mm-hmm. This idea that, you know, you've done all these things and you can use them in so many different ways. And I think that that combination of that that attitude that approach coupled with the kind of a reductionist mindset of structured forms means you get the opportunity to go deeper Mm -hmm. if all you ever do is you know your first form let's say you just do that forever Uh, at some point one of two things is going to happen you're going to stop doing it and quit Mm -hmm. or you're going to find some really interesting creative ways to dig into that form and to apply those techniques. Yes. And I, and I'm currently experiencing that right now. So as I mentioned before, we have five forms uh, leading up to black belt. So in the past, maybe five or six years, I'm still only on those first five forms as far as digging out mm. the, the bunkai drills. And like, you know, when I practice the higher level forms, I'm like, oh, I just really got like a, a vision of what this move can be. But I've been like, and this is going to sound really nerdy. I've been <laughs> saving myself for those forms <laughs> when I get to them. I love it. You know, I'm like, oh, I, I don't, I, I don't want to, I don't want to break my focus or I don't want to break my concentration and and start getting into like the bunkai of like the higher level forms because I'm still working on, you know, forms one through five. And I'll, you know, every day I come up with something that I'm like, oh, I could, I could, you know, I'm doing a low block in a front stance and then a stepping and punch, but I'm going to do it like this against a partner instead of how I did it before. And, mm-hmm. you know, and it's, it's fun. It, 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 it's fun. And whenever I bring it up to my students, they always look at me like I have six heads because they don't, they're not seeing it the way that I see it. So yeah. it, 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 it's a fun but yet challenging, um, you know, discovery and, uh, you know, and, and I have, I have two students that are starting to see it and recognize it, you know, and we, we had those kind of shared epiphanies, uh, you know, recently. And it's like, that was like the happiest, you know, the, the happiest thing that like, you get it. Now you're starting to see what I see. You know, I think that comes from, doing a form so many times where you kind of reach that level of mushim where you don't have to think about what the next move is so therefore you can address what might be happening in this in this imaginary battle Mm. the best drill i know for opening that up and i was pretty lucky that that i was exposed to this drill really young I, I was, 
I think I was probably 20 before I realized there were schools that taught a single understanding of, of application within forms. When you do this, you are blocking this technique. I, I, I didn't realize that was a thing some schools did. Mm -hmm. And so there, there certainly are. So for some of you out there, this may not apply, but I, I, I wouldn't surprise me if this is something you already do. We would kind of do almost a reverse of what many would do. Someone would be in the middle and they would do the form pretty much as is, just really slowly. And the other people in the class there or in the group, their responsibility was to present an attack that that person could reasonably defend and counter with that sequence, you know, those two or three movements. So the people on the outside, they're like, I don't want to punch every single time. That's getting boring. What happens if I throw a front kick here? What happens right. if I throw a spinning back kick here? Right. And so you end up with a lot of interesting, like, oh, and that would never work. And But you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again. And you end up seeing this block can be a block here. It can be a block here. It could be a block here. And it starts opening minds up. Mm -hmm. So much fun. <laughs> so much it. fun. And it's like... You know, I have this 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 thing that I've been doing for all these years, and it's always providing me with something new. It's always providing me with like, you know, like uh, I never thought of it like this. I never thought of it like that. And yeah, when I'm when I'm doing the solo version of the form by myself, when I'm getting my reps in, it's the same. But you know, the meanings are constantly changing. You know, and it's like, oh, I, I, you know, I'll be lying in bed at night getting ready to fall asleep and I'll I'll think of something else. And I'm like, I can't wait to get in tomorrow <laughs> and try it and see if it's legit or not. You know, so it's it's fun. It's a um, it, it, it's a fun kind of fun. challenging, but yet equally frustrating thing sometimes, mm. especially when. When I know the answer to this particular problem is right in my right in my reach, or if it's like I know that this move can be done like a choke, but I can't quite get how. And then I'll ask my <laughs> jujitsu instructor, and you know he chokes me, and then it's like, okay, how did you do that? <laughs> and then once you come to, you say, okay, can someone take a picture of that so yes. I can see what? It <laughs> yes, I love it. This has been great. This has yes. been a lot of fun. So I, we're we're gonna end. In what advice would you offer up as your kind of final words today to the people that are listening? I think my advice to if you're a beginner or intermediate belt rank, um, my my advice would be to keep plugging away the um you know the the, the frustration that somebody might feel when they can't when they can't get through a certain thing or when they finally get to like some of the more difficult belt ranks, I think for some people can be discouraging. So my, my advice would be to keep plugging away because in, in martial arts training, there, there are certainly lots of ups and downs and plateaus and be willing to enjoy the ride and be, be, uh, how should I say, be accepting of the journey. Um, I, I view, I view training like when somebody is a, a, uh, from white belt to black belt, I, I liken it to learning your ABCs, you know, after you learn the first 26 letters of the alphabet, you know, if you were to achieve your black belt, then it's not like, okay, you're going to learn, you know, letters 27 through 50, but you learn how to grow and use those letters and put together simple words, you know, and then maybe second degree black belt might be learning to put together simple phrases, whereas higher belt ranks, you're, you're, you're learning how to take those words and those phrases and craft chapters and novels and things like that. So my advice would be that, you can never be bored. You can never be bored with training if you have the right instructor and somebody to put you on the, the right path to, you know, what you want to accomplish and what you want to become. 
So I would say for somebody to have a little bit of patience and enjoy the ride. Did you enjoy that one? I did. I had a great time. I always have a great time. And that's the beauty of the show. It's the beauty of the format is that we get to hear so many different things about the guest and their journey that it's pretty rare. In fact, I would say never, maybe at least for me, I can't speak for all of you listening, but I never come away from an episode not having learned something, not feeling pumped about training, not feeling some really positive value in the story that I just heard. So thank you, sir, for coming on the show. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for, for being such a great guest. And I hope we get to talk again. To those of you listening out there, if you're still with me, I hope you are. Go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Go look at the photos from this episode. Look at the transcripts. Look at the links and the social media and the videos and all, all the other things that we do to round out your experience for the guest interviews as well as the topic episodes. We bring you as much context as we can because, well, there's a lot of value in here. Remember, what's the goal? Connect, educate, entertain. We're doing everything we can to check all three of those boxes every time we do a show. And if that means something to you, if you want to support us, well, we've got the Patreon. We've got a growing list of books. In fact, we've launched, what, two more in the last week? Go over to Amazon and, and search for Whistlekick and see what I'm talking about. But you could also leave a review on iTunes or Spotify or Stitcher or Google or Facebook or tell people what's going on or grab something at whistlekick.com or support the Patreon patreon.com slash whistlekick and you know did you know that we made a fight conditioning program it leverages all the things that you might expect for goals that's a terrible sentence jeremy i'm not even going to cut it it <laughs> it takes all the things that you would expect someone would need to prepare for an intense cardiovascular martial arts event whether that's competition or training testing whatever it is but it's done in a way that is going to get you maximal results with minimal input. If you want to just go out there and run, you may or may not get there. In fact, you're probably not going to get there. You're not going to get the results that you need. Why? Because the demands on the body are dramatically different. And we explain all that. So go to whistlekick.com. Sorry, whistlekickprograms.com. I'm botching this and I'm going to leave it in because I want to be authentic. I want you guys to know this is how this goes sometimes. Whistlekickprograms.com. Find the fight conditioning program. Check it out. Understand what we've done. There's nothing else out there like it. And this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to bring you these programs that address the needs of martial artists from a martial arts perspective, but with scientific research, because honestly, nobody else is. So maybe this is our niche. Maybe this is the thing that we can do better than anybody else. We're trying. We're looking for opportunities to serve you. If you have suggestions to that end, guest suggestions, topic suggestions, feedback of any kind, let me know. Jeremy at Whistlekick.com. Don't forget our social media is at Whistlekick everywhere you might think of. And that's all I have for you now. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.